Any generation that was playing those games or started, like my son, with that as that, then to them it's a no-brainer. They like both. There's collectibles for digital, there's collectibles physically, but most of the sci-fi uh, fantasy geek audience has a pretty wide spectrum. But if you look at it as audience development, then what you're talking about is that you have fans of theater, fans of Broadway, fans of London's West End, whatever it is, that's what you have a fan of. It isn't necessarily a particular play, although there obviously is that, or a playwright. You go where your audience is. So you, that means you have to listen to your audience and you have to ask your audience, what do they want? And yeah, that changes on a regular basis because of what they can afford, what they're interested in. You know, the, the economics of being a fan changes with the economics of where you live. So therefore, be creative. Welcome to the Theatre Art Life podcast. Today we're talking with Jenny Stephen. Jenny is the ultimate geek and sci-fi enthusiast turned digital strategist and consultant extraordinaire. With a decade of diverse expertise in programming, content creation, marketing and more, she founded Clio Consulting in 2004, becoming the go-to digital marketing resource for entertainment companies. Jelly, Jenny's stellar work has earned her recognition in the industry, working with iconic franchises like Star Wars, James Bond, Predator, Stargate, Alien, and more. Her true passion lies in fostering lasting connections between intellectual property owners, creators, and their fandoms. Jenny offers valuable insights into sustaining relationships with fandoms and navigating the dynamic world of Film 3 and Web 3. Get ready for this exciting journey into the world of geek properties fueled by passion and community building magic. Jenny, welcome to the show. Thanks very much. Thanks for having me. Lovely to meet you. I love what your job is. Tell me how you became a digital <laughs> strategist and consultant for entertainment. Oh, you know, like most jobs for women in the entertainment industry, it was a very long organic path, but it, I started in film and television. Mm -hmm. And pretty early on, I'm 60 this year. So pretty early on, I was as you do when you get into the entertainment industry, I was taking all of the jobs to find out what I wanted to do, where I could get it. And I was working at a couple of different studios. And one of the studios had a production designer. And he was working on very, very early version of what was called the Avid technology. And it was called a video toaster. And I was hooked. That was it. I, I wanted to work at anything that was using computers. It was anything that had to do with online. And I started just taking all the jobs I could find that were working online. I also, at the same time, being a huge geek myself, was online in Usenet groups. This is very old for anybody who's listening. In the old days, before there was forums or even AOL chat, there were Usenet groups. And I was completely hooked. I was <laughs> with X-Files and Buffy and all of the good chat rooms uh, and fan groups. And that was the seed for me. And then as happens, you follow a different path for a little while. And I was producing a lot and I decided to get into digital. And so what I started to do was produce content for digital in 1993. And from there, it just kept going. At each job found me another job that led to another really cool thing until I finally landed over at 20th Century Fox and I was working in digital marketing and nobody wanted to do geek sci-fi titles. No, th at the time, it was 2000, 2001, nobody cared. They weren't thinking that that was a big deal yet. And I would be in a meeting and someone would say, oh, we have to do this campaign for the back catalog of fill in the blank. And nobody would raise their hand and I'd be like, I'll do it. Yeah. I want to do it. Yeah. And one of the things that we did early on that we discovered was, oh, gee, big surprise. There's a huge fandom online. Mm -hmm. And so I was just very lucky. It, it was following my passion in an area in entertainment that I had wanted to go to anyway. And I just got to be part of that kind of new group that worked with everybody. 
And so what ended up happening was I would be given all of those campaigns. Mm. And it was, it was amazing. And, you know, in 2004, I went off on my own, but I was still consulting with Fox and with Sony and with Universal doing what I needed to do. And it was mainly producing. Mm. And then about 10 years ago, I had worked for a long time with a lot of fandoms on a lot of great properties. And I realized that there weren't enough people paying attention to the fandoms themselves. There weren't enough people reaching out and creating relationships that were sustained with the fandoms of these amazing properties and franchises. Mm -hmm. So that's what I started doing 10 years ago was very specifically working as a fandom developer, an audience developer. And that's what I do. And when I started, it was a made up job. So. Yeah. What a what an uncharted territory of a job though, right? Like how do you go, okay, yeah. let's pick a fandom. Where do you start with that? Well, luckily with online, it's not so hard. I mean, the, starting way back with when I, I started doing um, in the late 90s, I was doing video game marketing mm. campaigns and content online. And so I lived online as my job, but I also as a fan was online. So mm -hmm. the very first thing you do, which is any marketer will tell you is where's your audience? That's the very first question you ask. And the easy part for me was that for a sci-fi geek property, there's, there were, there's more now, but there were some pretty obvious places that they were hanging out. Mm. And so that's where you went first. And that's where you went to go talk to people. And then there's what I've developed is essentially eight pieces of the fandom pie. And a huge part of that is events. And that's where you really need to connect with fans, whether it's a small local regional event or Comic-Con, it doesn't matter. You need to learn where are those fans? What are they asking for? What do they want? And, and connect with them, spend mm. time with them. Yeah. Have you found that like, I watch my children want to buy digital things that don't exist now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this yep. is I mean, obviously, I'm not of the generation, but like, why you want to buy something online? That's, uh, has there been a big shift to that kind of like digital assets? Yes. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Oh, for sure. And, it, you know, again, it goes back to video games, right? It's mm. if you think about it as a game where all of your assets are downloadable or not, they're digital. Mm -hmm. They're all digital. So if I'm playing a game and I'm winning and I've collected, collected, it's all digital. So any generation that was playing those games or started like my son with that as that, then to them, it's a no brainer. They like both. There's collectibles for digital, there's collectibles physically, but most of the sci-fi uh, fantasy geek audience has a pretty wide spectrum. There'll mm. be 60 year olds who want just digital downloads because they don't want any more stuff in their yeah. house. They don't want any more stuff. And then you've got, you know, Gen Alpha, who's saying, I don't have the place to put it. I don't have the money, but I'll take a digital download because that's really cool. Mm. And especially if it's something very unique. So it's an opportunity. I mean, just as I've seen so many radically different things across the spectrum over the years, this is another opportunity to connect. And it's an easy, it's super low hanging fruit to connect mm. with a fan is to provide something that is very unique. Maybe an artist has created it for that IP or that franchise, and they get something that's downloadable that they can hold on their phone that nobody else gets. That's pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. I really, I, it's interesting because obviously in the video game world and the movie world and the franchises that exist in that space, there's a lot of, I, I guess, time and, and money put into marketing that way. Whereas a lot of audience work in the live entertainment industry. And I think that the, the live entertainment industry in terms of theatrical productions and stuff is way far behind in this digital space than yeah. they should be. Do you, would you agree to that? Yes, absolutely. And, and it's, it is ironic that whether you are Broadway theater, whether you are film streaming, <laughs> Twitch playing a game, on YouTube, TikTok, it doesn't matter. The, the irony is that the entertainment industry is always the first in and the last in simultaneously, just depending <laughs> upon which audience you're talking about. Yeah. And I always laugh because it's, you know, online, 
there are only certain industries that we're going to try and experiment online. And there's some of the obvious, but the entertainment industry is always one of the first because it's going to always be looking or you're going to have producers or creators or artists who are out there trying, Mm. doing something. I don't even know what the next thing is going to be, but they're already out there doing it. And we just haven't found it yet. We haven't discovered them. They're out there ahead. But ironically, at the same time, I've got the studios where I'm having a meeting just last month where I'm having to convince somebody in the studio that this is worthwhile to go try to reach a fandom for a franchise that exists, by the way, that I've worked on in the past. And that there are probably 500,000 to a million active fans online right now Mm. doing something. So in other words, they are actively talking or purchasing existing merchandise Mm. and they just didn't think it was worth reaching out to them. And literally it was a, and I've just talked about this recently and I'm just gobsmacked by it. It was a, well, if we build it, they will come conversation. And that's, I mean, that is exactly what you're talking about. It's, it is, I've got artists or talent or fandoms or franchises way out in front. Mm. And then, And then I've got the studio kind of bringing up the rear, slow, not really into it. I mean, there's always people in the studio that are excited, that are young, that are pushing Mm -hmm. at the same time, which is great. But I'm always surprised because Gen X is, for the most part, except for Disney, you've got Gen X leading these studios and production companies right now who grew up reading comic books, are huge geeks. You would never have had a Barbie movie. 20 years ago, because the people still in charge would never have been able to understand why that was a slam dunk. Mm -hmm. But I'm still completely blown away when I'm talking to somebody that's a Gen Xer and and I'm what people call Gen Jones somewhere in the middle, but, and I'm talking to a Gen Xer saying, why don't you get this? Why Mm -hmm. don't you understand that this is where the fans are? And I usually start by asking them, so what are you a fan of? What do you watch? What franchise? What did you watch as a kid? Was it, you know, He-Man? Was it uh, Buffy? Depending upon where you are in the spectrum, you know, whatever it is, I try to find what that natural fandom was that they had. Maybe they collected Matchbox cars or whatever it is, because that's the only way I can get them to understand is to talk to them personally about their own fandom. Mm. Well, being a Gen X, <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I'm always fascinated about. I, I think, like, especially in live entertainment and theatrical worlds, there's it's such a extra potential source of revenue that could be cultivated within the market that just isn't spending a lot of time. And when you look at franchises like Disney, who are masters of, you know, going on a ride and on the way out from the right. ride, walking through right. the merchandise store and and it's yeah. all very strategic and calculated and it's there and available and accessible to you and 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 that that potential is there for theatrical productions everybody's walking out of a theater show right like <laughs> I, it, always, it always amazes me especially because theater makes so much sense i'm working actually with a pr company um she's a consultant but she's got a small company She's based in Atlanta, and she's working on one of my sci-fi geek franchises right now with me. Mm -hmm. But a huge part of her business is Broadway. And she does an enormous amount of digital distribution PR for Broadway shows. Right. And she and I were just talking about this. I told her I was going to be on the podcast. And she said, you know, I am just really surprised that there's this gap for theater. Mm. that there isn't this fandom development for theater audiences. But she said she thinks the maybe the the disconnect is that people don't think of theater as return audiences. And that's mm. honestly what a franchise relies on. Right. And what a franchise from my point of view for fandom development relies on. But if you look at it as audience development, mm. then What you're talking about is that you have fans of theater, fans of Broadway, fans of London's West End, whatever it is, that's what you have a fandom. It isn't necessarily a particular play, although there 
obviously is that or a playwright or a particular writer that you follow through all of the plays that she's written. You know, that's, there's that as well, obviously. Mm. That mm. one is a little bit harder to pin down. But she and I got talking about the fact that what it should be is that it's going after fans and audiences that love theater, that love mm. live entertainment, that love to go to Alvin Ailey's dance, that love whatever it is that that's what they do is that because I grew up with that. I grew up in San Francisco and my mm. family were huge theater. I mean, we went in. So for anybody who's in other California, ACT was always where you went downtown mm. in San Francisco. And we would go every month to a play. And that's how I was raised. So it wasn't so much that you were a Shakespeare lover or George Bernard Shaw or whoever it was. It was, you know, for instance, going to see a dance was huge for me. I loved it. It was that experience of sitting in a live theater with mm. other people who all had the same expectation of that, oh, okay, the lights just went up. This is going to be amazing. And that's what my friend and I were talking we should be going after is there's a huge worldwide global audience that loves live entertainment, whether it's a concert, it's a play, it's dance, it's performance artists, whatever it is. That global audience, is a fandom mm. and they're a community. I could talk to anybody in the world about live entertainment and it doesn't matter if I liked um, super, super out there uh, live uh, performance art or Shakespeare, we would find a commonality mm. because we love that moment of being in the seats watching something live. And that's what people should be going after because that is that is an existing community. And now a note from our sponsor. The Theatre Art Life podcast is proud to be sponsored by Clearcom. Clearcom is the leader in voice communications for theatre and the performing arts. Call your cues with the simplicity and elegance of Clearcom Intercom Solutions. You can find them at C-L-E-A-R-C-O-M dot com. Go check them out. Absolutely. And I think also the fact that it is transient and non-lasting should be the reason to capitalize it and by that I mean yeah if you're following the Marvel franchise you can always sit down on a Saturday afternoon and watch a Marvel movie but you'll right. never get that opportunity to see that show again and I you know like right. I, I mean obviously I come I'm a bit of a theater geek but if I walk into somebody's house and they have original posters from all the shows that they've been to or went to right. like there's 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 a uniqueness in terms of being able to capitalize on this is the first poster and it'll only be available for this month right like, go right. right 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 yeah and there's a connection there for you mm. and it's the two of you then can talk about your shared experiences mm. even if you like different things which i think is very unique to a live theater audience or a live entertainment in general because part of you can see the toxicity in fandoms with Star Wars or Marvel or all the things that I deal with with sci-fi geek audiences. And that is a very narrow path to walk. Right. But in general, I have found that live entertainment audiences, and I can just relate it to conventions, geek conventions, they don't care. Mm. They could literally be online in a toxic conversation. But when you're talking to them about the convention that they get to go to, there is none of that. Everybody's excited. You're there. You're there to see whomever you're there to see. And there is no, uh, oh, why are you here to see them? There's none of that. Mm. It's, this is going to be a very cool experience. Aren't we really excited? We're here. This is an amazing trip that I've made to this. That's all you hear. And so, mm -hmm. oh, you know, the cosplay, whatever it is, there is no, uh, or there's very little antagonism to someone who, if you were online, would be incendiary in two seconds. Mm. And I think that shared experience of that live entertainment is that connection. So like you said, you could walk into a friend's house that you didn't even know loved a particular type of play or dance entertainment that they went to, and they have something up on the wall, and you're like, oh my gosh, and instantly you have a connection. That's right. Yeah. No, it's amazing. What do you think about, like, I, I find that uh, this has been a, a conversation with um, Theatre Out Life and, and some stuff that we're thinking about in terms of business development. What mm. do you think about, there's a big reticence from the community in the theatrical world to look at programs going from a physical program 
to a digital program. Yeah. So there is a bit of a yeah. rub with um, theatrical audiences about tradition and, you know, like mm-hmm. I think there's a history and a routine about theatrical attendance that people like to honour and some of that transformation into the modern world is is a tough one, digital programs being one of them. Right. Um, um, and then... Uh, then I'll ask you another question because I'll, I'll let you answer this question, that question first, because then it's about, <laughs> about audiences. I don't want to dilute this one. <laughs> no, no, no. And it's, I think it's all connected. Uh, obviously, we all went through COVID. So we know that there was a, and is still a constant conversation, at least in my world specifically, about um, what's either called a live experience or what's called a common experience. So if you're watching a streaming together live, an episode, so for instance, Avatar The Last Airbender released episodes each week. Mm-hmm. So did, you know, Disney for all Star Wars and Marvel. And the Netflix model and business development model has learned that you need to walk a line. There are some that you can drop all at once. There's a, a digital distribution model that works. But the live distribution model is important as well. And right now, as I am sure you've heard, there are nonstop arguments, discussions, contemplation of your navel about whether or not people are going to go back to watching, go back to watching movies. Mm. Well, as is evidenced by Barbieheimer this past summer and Mm. some of the biggest global, and even if you take into account inflation of ticket prices, it was still the largest audience in five years. Mm. So if we account for ticket, you're looking at actual individual people that went to the theater this past summer, it was more than 2019. Okay, Mm. so that means that you're going to have to work harder at providing good entertainment. And inflation in general is a huge problem. I think What I've seen with live entertainment, for instance, I'm going to be at WonderCon next week. WonderCon usually attracts anywhere from 60 to 100,000 people. And it is a primarily cosplay-based Comic-Con in Anaheim. Right. And it is sci-fi geek central, but it is the more creative end. So studios usually don't go. It's very much um, publishing and comics, and it's very creative. Their attendance has dropped because people can't afford to get there because it isn't just going. It's whether or not you pull people from across the world to come Mm -hmm. and they can't afford the travel. So what WonderCon did to alleviate that is that they created a lot more regional connections to fans. So there's day trips, day tickets, right? So this year, they're pretty much back to about 65,000, which is their average. So, and then you've got, you know, day people that come in. So in, in essence, they'll probably end up around 75, 80,000. That took them four years to get back to. And it did, but they had to shift what they did to attract that live entertainment person. Coachella is sold out for the most part for the first weekend. It was not sold out in 2021. And that had a lot to do with fear, but now they're back in, they've got it. I think the biggest problem is price point, to be honest. I think live entertainment theater in particular, we go to the theater here in San Diego at the Old Globe a lot, and we've got season tickets. We couldn't do season tickets this year. It was too mm. expensive. Mm. But I get it. They had to raise prices because they don't have the same influx of theater goers that they used to have. Mm. I think what digital affords, and this is something that the opera did a long time ago that the old globe just caught on to during COVID, is that opera was providing to uh, different theater outlets like AMC live or repeat performances that you could buy a ticket to that was not as expensive to just go watch in your local theater, Mm. film theater. I think that's brilliant. Makes total sense. You still get an experience, but it's local and it is literally, unfortunately, a third of the price, but the opera still makes that money. Now, the Old Globe just finally caught on to that. They're starting to look into a distribution model for basically exporting what are originally La Jolla Playhouses too, 
Um, so the outsiders started at La Jolla Playhouse, but now it's on Broadway. Yeah. And they, they did a little bit of both. They did a digital distribution model, but they retained the rights. And that's really going to be what the big, I think, issue will be is retaining the rights to your IP, your franchise, whatever you've written. But if you can do a hybrid, I think you'll be successful and find a new revenue model. And it basically talking about that there's going to have to be a hybrid, that mm. regardless of whether or not it is live theater plays or film, streaming, opera, dance, whatever it is, it has to be that we're going to have to figure out a hybrid. And a, and a perfect opportunity for that is looking at what the, uh, the Met Opera just did, where they distribute the season via AMC theaters. And there's a couple of other examples. And the Comic-Cons are doing it as well, where they're offering tickets for virtual conventions, because what they've realized is there's also an opportunity here on a business model to reach audiences that otherwise wouldn't do it. Mm. And I think that that's what live theater is doing. And Broadway, I know, I know London's West End did it and uh, had a, um, had kind of a test run on a business model for this as well, where there are a lot of people around the world who would get to see this play, who would get to see this movie or whatever it is, this dance concert. And if you offer it simultaneously virtually, you've doubled, tripled, quadrupled your audience. Mm. And the price point is a lot lower. And, and while I think that live entertainment is never going to go away, I think that there does have to be a shift to this hybrid so that we can support it. And mm. I think that that's where fans can really find footing here is find out where you can support theater through a hybrid distribution model. So if you can go locally somewhere, please do it. Please go, go support local theater, go support local dance, local music. But if you also have an opportunity to do it digitally, go for it. it they're not as expensive. The tickets aren't as expensive. And how amazing is it that you get to see an artist that you wouldn't have gotten to see or a play because you've been able to do this streaming? And it isn't the same exact experience, but you're supporting entertainment. And that's, yeah. I think, for a fan, if you can support what you love, who cares how you do it? Exactly. And do you think that's also the path to younger audiences as well? Oh, yeah. I mean, a younger audience, to some degree, I've noticed the the live entertainment is eye opening for them because it isn't something that they've necessarily grown up with. So for my son, a lot of it was making sure that he did get to go to live entertainment because otherwise it would have just been digital. And what's interesting for that audience, for Gen Z and Gen Alpha, is that for them it's new. <laughs> it's a different experience, and mm. so it's it has an attraction because it's so radically different from what they've grown up with, which I think is amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah, no, I think definitely for um, audiences who are younger, there's got to be ways that, because they're all looking at the phones yet these days and they're, it's harder to get them out of their houses and all of that sort of stuff. So if we want people to join the live entertainment or theatrical universe we need to get to them through um through that you know that's right yeah exactly and it's it is again it goes back to the basic marketing question is where's your audience mm. where are they where are they living where are they experiencing this particular franchise this ip that you want and i think again it's that sense of community doesn't have to be around just a particular franchise or ip it can be in the lived experience of mm. being a fan. So you can share an experience with another fan, regardless if you don't follow the same geek franchise. Mm. And that's where there's a sense of community that for geeks, we've been doing it since we were in high school or younger, mm. where you found your tribe because everybody thought we were weird. I mean, I was a girl who loved Barbies, who collected matchboxes, and DC and Marvel comics. I mean, I was just not the one of the mill. <laughs> and then, you know, it's like I was dancing, but I was a cheerleader, but I was a geek and I was in the AV club. I mean, it's just, everybody's complicated. Nobody mm -hmm. is one thing. So mm -hmm. this gives a sense of community 
over something really, really easy entry. So whether it's digital as a fan or live entertainment or both, it doesn't matter if you like the same IP or franchise, that's a lived experience that you can share together that Mm. you are a fan of something. And that to me is the great equalizer. Everybody's a fan of something. You don't have to be the fan of the same thing, but it's really a great connection. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting because I think then for theatrical companies, et cetera, it's a little bit of a cut for the horse. Like they, they, they've got that extra revenue potential through the digital mediums, right. but they need to hire somebody to make sure that that happens and often they don't have the funds to get that. Right. And so, and then the people within the co- company are going to need to figure out how to start that themselves and they're not like you. Right. They have that strategy or that experience in how to right. – cultivate the fandom you know so that's that's something that we have to try and like I don't know, fix somehow. get the word out I mean I think that there's enough people there's certainly enough people in Gen Z that are old enough that are starting like my friend Mandy who's the PR she's looking at she's a huge Broadway the- live theater fan mm. so as a PR person that started her own business just two years ago she went out and pursued it And she said, here's where I think I can help you. And here's where I think we can help drive a new business model in this other area. Mm. So I think a lot of it comes from them where they're seeing a need or a gap and they go to the IP or the franchise or the Broadway in general, right? A Broadway company and say, hey, I see a need. Here's what I can do for you. And what all of us do as consultants is we always, especially if it's something we love, we're always saying, okay, here's how I can do it for you so that it doesn't break your bank. Because yeah. I love what you do and I want to find that bridge that you can get to all these fans. And I think there's a lot of us, out, I mean, I hate to say it, it's mainly women hmm. because women have a tendency to have to find the creative job because it isn't created for them. Hmm. And so I was very lucky. I was just talking about this last night. I was very, very lucky in my career that I had two very strong women producers as mentors, Mm. one extremely early on and one later on. But that was luck. And once I found it, it wasn't luck. It was, okay, I'm sticking to you like glue because I know that this is going to be challenging. I I mean, most of my career was being told you can't do that. That doesn't work. You know, all the normal stuff. And creating a particular job for myself became normal. Mm -hmm. because we look for the, even now, we look for a way to do what we want to do in the way that we know is a good way to do it and nobody's listening. Mm. So we just create it ourselves. And I think that a large part of what's happening right now that we see that is kind of the Wild West in entertainment, which I love, I think right now you have a lot of studios you have streamers, you have production companies, you've got Broadway, you've got all the different entertainment aspects and they're scrambling. Mm. It's post COVID. They put all their eggs in one basket because they didn't think long term. They panicked and now they're challenged and they don't know what to do. Even ones who did know what to do and made great choices prior to COVID are still feeling lost. And there's a lot of management by fear in the entertainment industry right now, which is unfortunate. Mm. And it's one of the reasons the strikes worked because the, the three major unions knew that if they didn't strike now, what was going to happen was that people would get very stuck in their ways post COVID. Mm. And it had, they had to force the conversation, Mm. literally force the conversation. Yeah. And it's still management by fear right now. It's mm. we get out of COVID and then we lose all well, we lost a year because of the strikes. And that means everybody has to be creative. And you still have a lot of people who are operating out of fear mm. and don't want to change the business model. And a lot of the people that I've talked to, they feel also, well, wait, I just changed the business model for COVID. And then I changed it post COVID. So now you're telling me I have to change it again. Yeah, mm. I am. Mm. That's what you're going to have to do. And to me, it, it's, to me, it's simple, but I'm a consultant, but to me, it's, <laughs> you go where your audience is. So you, mm. that means you have to listen to your audience and you have to ask your audience 
What do they want? And yeah, that changes on a regular basis a hundred because of what they can afford, what they're interested in. You know, the, the economics of being a fan changes mm. with the economics of where you live. So therefore, be creative. And what I find is, for the most part, it's a lot of women being creative, saying, okay, <laughs> I'll be flexible. I'll yeah. figure this out. And, yeah. and of course, I'm being very generalized. There are, unfortunately, there are very many women who are also based in the power structure right now who are also legitimately, and I get it, afraid. What do I yeah. do next? How do I do it? And I think, unfortunately, for women, that is a, uh, it's a double whammy when you're yeah. in the entertainment structure. But right now, the majority of the people that I'm working with are Gen X and Gen Z saying, okay, so what are we going to do next? Yeah. And I love that. Yeah. That's why, and that's, that's why I do what I do because it's fun and it changes all the time. Yeah. It's, 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 it's funny that you say that. So I think I've probably written my own job description for the last 10 years in any job mm. that I have to take, you know? Right. Yeah. And I think that for me, it's what you're t talking about is that mindset. What, what people have to feel and accept is that it's an ever evolving, ever changing beast now. Right. And, and with the advance of technology and AI and video gaming and VR and all of this, we just have to keep right. adapting. Otherwise you'll be left behind and Get in oh, and, yeah. and isn't that true for any creative, right? I mean, for the creative industry, no matter art, art in general. Yeah. yeah. It's, I, I think if you got into any artistic aspect, and obviously mine is more on the marketing content or content marketing, creation of content for marketing end, you don't get into it unless you are adaptable. Mm. And if you aren't, I don't know necessarily you find a job maybe that works for you that's consistent, but yeah. this industry is not consistent. Mm. Um, artistic endeavors in general are not consistent. Mm. And that's that for me that 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 when I, I hear you talk about that, that excites me because you're like, well, what opportunity is there that I'm not right. looking at or seeing or what could we do yeah. that could become something amazing rather than trying to rest on your laurels and go. Let's stay with what's worked because. Absolutely. Absolutely. Me, right? <laughs> <laughs> See, I mean, I think, I think, well, again, I think I've been extremely lucky. I had mm -hmm. nobody in my family was in the industry. <laughs> I just, I loved it. I knew I wanted to be in it. I mm -hmm. knew pretty early on that this is what I wanted to do. Um, my entire family thought I was moving to Sodom and Gomorrah when I went to Los Angeles. So, you know, it's, <laughs> it was definitely. <laughs> me out there by myself. But uh, what if someone asked me the other day, why do I think, because I always say that, that I've been lucky. And she said, well, okay, that may be true to a point, but what do you think you did that was different? And I, I had to really think about it. And I realized that it was exactly what you just said. It's the new doesn't frighten me. I'm always curious about it. So that worked for me. If I'm always curious and I'm always asking people, I'm fascinated with what you do. I'm fascinated with podcasts. I could never do a podcast. I do not have the discipline to do a podcast, but I find it fascinating. So I want to find out what is it that you do? What's different? What's cool about theater? I love that. Mm. So if you stay curious and you are always asking and you are open to the new, then you'll be lucky. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's what I, I mean. It's part of the reason why I love doing the podcast because every time I meet somebody, it's expanding not only my network, my knowledge, my experience, because I hear these wonderful stories about your life and your work. Then, you know, and right. even selfishly, I'm asking questions that are going to be beneficial to me, right? I, like, think, it's so I, cool. I think it's awesome. Yeah. I, and <laughs> I think anybody who's doing that, the podcast is, is curious, any podcast. They're doing it because they're curious. They want they want to know. They're they're interested in other people. How cool is that? Yeah. And I think if that's what you're doing and you're open to the new, whatever that is, in your job, in your career, in even if it's even if it's a pretty basic job, mm. then I think that it opens up new doors for you. But mm. 
that can be hard for people. And I get that. It's pretty hard to be open to the new when you're just struggling to put food on the table for the family. Um, So at that point, I just tell people, okay, then just be curious. Have you asked the person in your drudge job that works next to you what they do? mm -hmm. And if your job really is a drudge, then is there anything that you can go ask about in the company that you work for or you know, at the Burger King that you work for? Is there anybody that you can talk to that you might be curious about what they're doing? Because that's all it takes. That's mm. the only spark it takes is that one question to the right person. And you've suddenly made that connection. And, and honestly, that's all my job is, is making connections. Mm. Amazing. So we always ask our podcast guests the same last two questions. So I'm going to ask you this now. What's your most favorite thing about your job or the industry? Uh, Meeting fans. It Mm. doesn't matter to me what franchise it is, what IP that they're a fan of. Meeting fans and getting stories about why they're a fan of that particular franchise film series. I love that. It's Mm -hmm. connecting with people is amazing. Amazing. And if you could change one thing about your job or the industry, what would that be? Oh, geez. <laughs> um, I would change the toxicity. I would change the, the ability for people to be open to talking to each other. Because when they meet in person at a convention, you don't know if that person doesn't like your version of Star Wars. But if you're online, suddenly your enemies because you've said something stupid. So it's <laughs> if I could change the toxicity of it, that would be my number one goal to get people to listen to each other more online as much as they do in person. And I try to always remind people that if you met this person at a con, you're in general, most people at cons do not go in with preconceived notions about another person they're going to meet. In fact, there's a lot of repetition of, I'm going to be open, I'm going to do this. And people get in very, very big conversations and discussions at panels, et cetera. But when you're just down milling around, nobody's getting into a fight for the most part. I think I have in 22 years of working conventions, geek conventions, I have seen one fight. And I've been around the world to hundreds and hundreds of conventions. Yeah. And that was because somebody was drunk. So, you know, it's, if I could take that camaraderie and transfer it to fandom as a whole and say, hey, you are the same person when you go to this convention where you're completely open, please be that person online. That's what I would change. Yeah, that's such a good point. Stop the keyboard warriors. (laughs) I mean, who cares if someone has a different opinion from you? It's okay. Uh, yeah, it's it's just a it's a fascinating space, and when people argue online, that's, it's really yeah, strange. it is, it is, <laughs> and it is a it is a very narrow path we walk um, in terms of getting that audience because you have to appeal to the entire spectrum of the audience, 100%. all the time. So yeah, yeah. Jenny, what a pleasure it has been to meet you. I've really enjoyed our conversation. Thank you so much for being part of the Theatre Art Life podcast. I appreciate it. Absolutely. I'm so honored that you asked me and I, I really appreciate it because it's a whole different way of talking about what I do and I really appreciate you having me. Awesome. Thank you. Theatre Art Life is a global media site for entertainment. Memberships start at only $38 US per year. You can have unlimited access to our daily published articles, including entertainment news and the writings of active industry professionals, ensuring that you are always up to date on the global happenings in the world of entertainment. Become a part of the international entertainment community and join us now at www.theaterartlife.com.